Welcome everyone. Glad to have you here this afternoon. My name is Heather Bacher and I am the state coordinator for the Women for the Land program here in Indiana. We are the host for today's program. Um, I am um, happy to have you here for this last of uh, a series of four on pond management. If you would like more information about Women for the Land, please visit our website. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenter, Dr. Mitchell Ziske, to get us started. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> and thanks, everybody, for um, attending today. And thanks for having me these past four weeks. It's been a lot of fun. And, um, and hopefully we'll, uh, you'll all learn a bit today and we can have a great discussion about aquatic vegetation. And, and hopefully you, my daughter in the background is not being too noisy. <laughs> um, OK, let me share my screen here. And we'll get started. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we're going to continue our discussion about pond management and we're going to um, finish up today by talking about um, aquatic vegetation management. And, um, you know, the, the goal of today is to really just uh, give you some background about aquatic plants and algae if you don't know much about them, to just talk a little bit about some of the common types um, and, um, and also the, the methods we can use to manage them. And then I'm going to focus a little bit on, on some of the herbicides as well, because I know that's, you know, a lot of people uh, use herbicides and I can talk a little bit about the different types of herbicides and when you might decide to use them. Um, and, um, you know, definitely one of the keys with, with aquatic plant management is getting the ID right. And so, um, you know, we have some resources that can help you with that. And, and definitely, you know, if you feel, um, if you don't feel like you can identify the plants on your own, definitely reach out to some of your local um, resources or even you know, send me some photos and I can help you try and identify some of those. Uh, if you haven't been on the, any of the previous sessions, uh, this is just my contact information. Um, and then, so feel free to shoot me an email. And I also really encourage you to check out our website. Um, we have lots of great resources there. We have um, lots of publications, information. We have our podcasts up there. And then um, another great resource is, uh, is links to your local county contacts. You basically select your county in Indiana and you can uh, find all your different uh, resources there that you can reach out to. <coughs> so um, Purdue has some, some publications that can help you with aquatic plant management. Um, we have this, um, and so all of these publications are actually developed before, before I started at Purdue. Um, the author of, of these two publications here has since retired. And so we're actually in the process of updating these publications and we should have, have some new publications out in the next six months. Um, and we're also hoping to produce a waterproof uh, plant ID guide, similar to the fish ID guide that we have, uh, that can really help you identify some of the common plants in your pond. And, and once again, we're hoping to get this out within the next six months or so. This publication here basically covers the A to Z of aquatic plants. Uh, it talks a little bit about, um, you know, the biology of plants. It covers some of the different types of plants and also the different mechanisms that we manage them or, or how we can manage them. And that sort of will underpin a lot of what I talk about today. We have a, pub a short publication specifically about duckweed and watermeal. So if you're having issues with, with those, you can check out that publication. And then there's another uh, publication here that um, was also was authored by one of our county educators along with a biologist from Aquatic Control that talks specifically about harmful algal blooms. Um, and I'm gonna mention those briefly today, but if you um, wanna learn more about those or, they, or you sometimes get them in your pond or your lake, then definitely check out that publication. And just like um, the past sessions we've had, I'm gonna stop here a few times throughout the presentation for questions and then, and then at the end um, we can ask, you know, we can have time for questions, any questions about plants, but also any questions about pond management in general. Uh, maybe some things we didn't get to cover over these four sessions that you might be interested in, in asking. <clears throat> so I want to just reiterate, um, you know, the pond ecosystem is, is a complex environment and uh, it's really important for us to understand what's going on in the ecosystem. And this is probably most important with when we're managing aquatic vegetation. You know, definitely with, with fish management, we want to understand a little bit about competition and predation between the fish. But it's really the plants that that um, that take everything from you know all the way from the nutrients and the light and the type of sediment you have, and then they and it basically takes it through that food web, and it can change the the biomass you have in the lake, and it can change your water chemistry and all sorts of things like that. So, 
Um, so managing uh, aquatic plants is really, um, key, you know, one of the key things is understanding the different parts of that pond ecosystem. And, and if you missed our first uh, session on that, you know, I encourage you to check out the recording that we have to learn more about, about the different aspects of the pond ecosystem. And uh, so I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what aquatic plants need. And the requirements for aquatic plants are pretty similar to terrestrial plants, uh, but it's important to, to understand these requirements because um, you know, we can um, utilize this information in our management. So if we know that plants need certain things to grow, we can actually try and reduce or restrict some of those things to minimize that, that growth if we have too much growth. Alternatively, if we want to promote growth in our pond, then we can try and maximize some of these characteristics to help with that plant growth. So the first thing that plants need is uh, sunlight. And this includes the algae in the pond um, and all the vascular plants like the pond weeds, the lily pads, and, and even the emergent plants like cattails. So they need sunlight because they photosynthesize. This is how they get most of their energy. Um, at night, when there's no sunlight, they actually start to reproduce. Uh, sorry, they start to res respire. Uh, so they sort of breathe like we do. And so, um, in in the daytime, when they're photosynthesizing, they're producing a lot of oxygen in the pond, which is which is the main source of oxygen in, in our ponds. Uh, but at night, when they when they're respiring, they actually start to use some of the oxygen as well. Um, and the, the amount of sunlight that these plants get not only is not only uh, dictated by the you know day versus night or cloudy days versus sunny days or, or even the seasons, but water clarity is a big part to this. If you have a really clear pond, sunlight can penetrate further uh, and you find that your plants will grow deeper in your pond. If you have a turbid pond or a, or a muddy pond, you may only get plants growing in the first couple of feet of the water column, or you might not have very many plants growing at all. Um, I've, uh, we have some uh, local, um, you know, strip pit ponds uh, here in Lafayette that I fish occasionally and, and they get vegetation growing down to about 25 feet in those ponds because they're, they're crystal clear. Uh, one of the other key components that plants need to grow are nutrients. And so um, throughout this series, we've spoken a lot about nutrients and, and how nutrients enter the pond. Um, and, and the plants use these nutrients to grow. So the nutrients combined with the sunlight is, is how, they, how they survive and how they grow. Um, you know, nutrients, there are lots of different nutrients that enter the pond and, and lots of different nutrients that are needed for, to sustain life in the pond. Um, the, the limiting nutrient typically in freshwater is phosphorus. And so what that means is if you add phosphorus to the pond, you're typically gonna get more plant growth. Whereas if you add nitrogen to the pond, you may not see big changes in, in plant growth because there's already enough nitrogen in the pond. This is different to, to the ocean where nitrogen is typically the limiting nutrient there. And, and that in addition to nitrogen is what can add or encourage growth in, in salt water. So these nutrients are used by plants like you see in this photo here, but they're also used by algae. And, and in particular, they're used by microscopic algae called phytoplankton. And, and typically those algae are what respond to nutrient inflows the quickest um, and they have the shortest lifespan. And so, so if you get a rainfall event and you get nutrients flowing into your pond, typically what you'll see is, is the phytoplankton growing first. You might get a sort of green soupy appearance to your pond. Then you might get some filamentous algae growing. And it's, and it's not until sort of further down the succession that you might start to see increased growth of, of pond weeds and other plants like that. And then the final um, sort of uh, key requirement that plants have or that most plants have is substrate for them to take root in. And so, um, you know, most of these plants are attached to the bottom, the, the submersed plants like pond weeds um, and coontail and stuff like that, they're all, um, they're all rooted to the bottom. Even some of our floating plants like lily pads have roots that extend down to the bottom. Uh, it's not, um, the only plants that don't have roots in the bottom are things like floating algae or filamentous algae. Uh, and also things like duckweed and, and water meal. But, but most other plants have roots going into the substrate and they typically prefer um, fairly soft substrate like mud, silt and sand. Um, and so understanding that may allow us to manipulate that substrate to prevent some of that um, plant growth in the future. So I've showed this diagram once before, but I just wanted to uh, reiterate the, you know, that plants need 
uh, to photosynthesize to grow. And when they do this during the daytime, they're actually using up CO2 in the oxygen in the pond and releasing dissolved oxygen. And that's a really beneficial process to the pond because that's where most of the dissolved oxygen comes from. At night, there's this process reverses because plants, instead of photosynthesizing, they start to breathe. And so they use oxygen from the pond and release CO2 just like we do. And the importance of this with, with regards to plant management is that when you have really high abundance of plants in your pond, you can get really big shifts in the, in the oxygen in that pond. So you might have you know, saturation of oxygen in the daytime because all of these plants are producing oxygen. But at night, you might get oxygen levels dropping quite low because a lot of these plants are using, are using up that oxygen. And so, like I said, one of the keys for um, managing aquatic plants is being able to identify them accurately. Um, in some cases, the, the exact species is not that important. Um, for the most part, you know, all of the pondweeds are typically managed the same way. You don't necessarily need to know which exact species of pondweed is, but you need, need, do need to know that it is a pondweed and that it's not, you know, an emergent plant like a lily pad or it's not an algae like, um, like cara. And so there are some plants that are pretty easy to tell apart. And there are some plants that are, that are more difficult to tell apart. And that's where um, knowing some basics about um, species identification can be, can be useful. Um, and so it's important to know what algae is because typically we treat algae with different chemicals and we treat them differently than we do plants. And so some algae is really easy to identify. It, it's that sticky filamentous stuff that sort of clings to everything or it forms those those dense mats on the surface. Uh, when you get a, a, a phytoplankton bloom, it's pretty easy to tell because it's like that green soupy uh, water that you see. Um, but there are some algae that actually look a lot like plants. And so if anybody has seen cara before, this actually looks a lot like a plant, um, but, it's, but it's actually an algae. And if you try and treat it with chemicals that you might use for a plant, you won't actually get any results. Um, another one of these sorts of algae is called Nutella. And that's another plant that you, that another algae that looks like a plant and can be a little deceptive. And I'll show you some examples of those here in a minute. Um, algae you know, algae grows quickly because it, it typically can grow faster than plants. And so it's, like I said, it often responds to nutrient increases. The fir, um, it's first to respond. And so it's often best to treat algae often uh, and early in the season. So if you you know, you want to sort of start treating some of this algae before it becomes these dense mats across the entire pond. It's sort of, sort of a little bit like mowing your grass. You know, if you, if you just keep trimming it back, keep hitting it with a little bit of, of chemicals or, or whatever your management protocols are, do that regularly throughout the season can prevent some of those, some of those big uh, masses of, of algae. Uh, so there are floating plants, plants in the pond. Some of these are completely free floating. Uh, water meal is, is this floating, uh, plant. It's actually the smallest plant in the world. Uh, it looks, they look like little green grains of sand. Um, no, they don't have any roots at all. Duckweed is a little larger. It floats around. It has these little roots that hang down in the water and filter and nutrients from the water. Um, and, then, uh, and then some floating plants like lily pads and water shield, they have roots that extend down to the bottom. And, and we need to treat floating plants a little differently because the, the part of the plant that's up on the surface is exposed to the air. And so we can actually treat it with, with other types of, of things that we might not be able to do with submerged, submerged plants. Our submerged plants are, are basically anything that grows in the water. Um, and so it's, they're typically rooted to the bottom and then they grow up through the water column. They may um, sort of grow up to the surface and then sort of mat along the surface or they may, might have floating leaves that, that float up on the surface, but they also have a lot of plant material that's in the water column. And these are the ones that provide a lot of habitat for fish and invertebrates. And so these are really important for our ecosystem, but they can also choke out ponds and lakes if they get too dense. And then finally, the last group of plants we, we sort of consider are these emergent plants. So these are the ones that grow right along the shoreline. They might have their roots in the water, some of their plant material in the water, but they have a large proportion of their plant material out of the water. So these are things like cattails, water willows, phragmites, things like that. And so um, just to show you some examples of these common plants, some of you, you, some of you may have seen these before. So here we have a lake that has a phytoplankton bloom. You can see it's this green soup color. And this is because you have these microscopic algae 
basically through the entire water column. Um, and these are important for feeding fish um, because a lot of the invertebrates and the zooplankton will eat this stuff and then the fish will eat them. Uh, so these can be really important for the productivity of your pond. Uh, and sometimes we'll see these blooms in the spring, uh, sometimes in the fall, or if we have like a rainfall event that brings nutrients in. Um, you need to be a little careful of these because um, you know, a photo like this, um, there's obviously a lot of phytoplankton in this water. And what will happen is they will use up those nutrients quite quickly. And, um, and well, after what happens then is they all start to die. And when all of these phytoplankton start to die and sink to the bottom, they then get decomposed by bacteria and they can cause uh, depletion of oxygen. And so, um, so if you want to try and minimize getting these really large blooms if you can and you can do that by restricting the nutrients coming in and things like that another algae that um that some people will be unfortunate enough to get in their ponds is is blue green algae blue green algae is actually a type of bacteria so it's even smaller than phytoplankton um, but it photosynthesizes so it's still green um, and um, these, the, the downfall or the, or the real negative impact of these cyanobacteria is that sometimes they can release harmful toxins into the water. And so not all species release these toxins. And I've recently found out that even species that do release these toxins don't always release the toxins. They, they do sometimes and, and not other times. And so the key here is that if you have blooms of, of blue-green algae is to get your water tested for these toxins. They can testing the water you know, a few times during a week can help you monitor whether or not these toxins are present. And if they are present, you really need to stop using the pond. You know, they, these toxins can kill animals, they can um, cause people to get sick. And so um, this is something that you wanna monitor really closely. Uh, they typically, you know, these blooms typically form these scum, um, this surface scum. And that's because these bacterial cells actually float it's an adaptation that allows them to get maximum access to sunlight. And so that's why, um, you know, you'll see these, these surface scums as opposed to the phytoplankton bloom, which is typically throughout the entire water column. And here you see some typical uh, filamentous mat forming algae. It sort of clogs to everything. You can get this uh, green brown stuff on the surface, or you can get really bright green sort of hairy algae that clings to stuff down in the water column. Uh, and once again, if you get a lot of this stuff, it can really start to choke out a pond. And then finally, this is just an example of a macroalgae. So macroalgae is just a large algae. And like I said, these can really start to look a lot like plants. So this is cara, sometimes called musk grass. Um, and as you can see, it looks quite a lot like a submerged plant. Um, if, but this needs to be treated the same way that we treat all of these, algae, uh, these types of algae. Some common submersed plants include the pondweed. So this is an example of American pondweed. They have um, parts of the plant grow up through the water column and they'll get these leaves that float on the surface. Um, other types of submerged plants that you might see are things like coontail. Uh, this is uh, water milfoil. There are a few different species of this, including Eurasian water milfoil, which is, um, which is invasive. And then we have other submerged plants. This is American elodia. Um, another similar species is hydrilla, and hydrilla is, a, um, is an invasive species in the US. So, um, so these are just some examples of some submerged plants that you might see. Um, like I said, these provide great fish habitat, great um, places for invertebrates to grow. Um, and it's not until they, they become really um, dense that they cause problems in a pond. So some common floating plants, um, we, you know, you have water lilies and water shield. These are, um, you know, I'm sure you've seen these before and these have typically have these stems that extend down to the bottom and they have roots in the, in the substrate. Um, and then you have these free floating plants. So this is an example of duckweed over here. You can see it's, it's pretty small. It's, it's smaller than like a, you know, clover, a leaves of clover. Um, they float around on the surface and have these little roots that hang down and filter the water. And then watermill I mentioned is this really small plant. You can see that it looks like grains of sand um, and they sort of float on the surface as well. And both of these can actually be a little tricky to, to get rid of. And, and, um, and so there's, there's some specific management strategies you can take with these. And lastly, the emergent plants um, are those that grow along the shoreline. You've probably seen these as well. These are cattails, they're common in a lot of areas. 
Um, these are Phragmites, uh, which have uh, look a little similar to cattails, but they have this different sort of um, seed structure at the top. These Phragmites are invasive, um, uh, so they're really good at sort of getting in and overpopulating an area. Uh, this is pickerel weed, um, and then this here is is an example of water willow. So, so these are just things that grow along the shoreline. These are important because they can provide, they can help buffer nutrients entering the pond. They can stop erosion. Um, but as you can see, they also cause problems with access. If you had these Phragmites growing along your pond, you wouldn't be able to, to access the pond. And so, so sometimes we, you know, we want to get rid of these, um, but sometimes it's nice to keep some parts of the pond, um, you know, uh, populated with these emergent plants, particularly those areas where you might get a lot of nutrients flowing in. All right, I'm gonna just stop there to see if there are any questions for the moment. Um, and then we'll kick on to talk about some management strategies. Miss Julie's asking, are all the algae uh, toxic or is it just the blue-green algae? Yeah, good question. It's just the blue-green algae. So the phytoplankton is not toxic at all. Um, you could swim in that green soup if you wanted to. <laughs> um, uh, and and um, there are, you know, there are, thousands of species of phytoplankton, um, and, but they provide important food. And the filamentous algae and the cara and all of those things are not toxic either. It's just those blue-green algae. Um, and they release a few different types of toxins. A common one is microcystis or microcystins. Uh, and, um, and that's commonly, you know, can make animals sick and die. And, and that's why if you've ever uh, visited like a public lake that they'll sometimes have closures because of this blue-green algae. So um, and you could also have that blue green algae and not have any toxins present. But you know, if you're if you know your pond is susceptible to blue green algae, or you notice a bloom of it, then definitely stop using the pond and start getting it tested and and make sure that that toxin is not present um, before you start using it again. Mitch, do we know what causes that and um, where? Like, are there some places that it? We can expect it not to be present. For example, you know, I have small water features in my yard and I have some of those other algae and things, but would would I ever see the blue-green algae? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We actually have a great um, podcast episode where we spoke to the author of that guide um, and she she's an ecotoxicologist and knows a lot about this stuff. Um, but what she said is that um, typically the blue-green algae... Um, Typically what they look for with, with blue-green algae is the ratio of phosphorus to nitrogen in the water. And like I said, typically phosphorus is limiting. Um, and, and in most ponds you know, that, that have a lot of nutrients and a lot of algae, we have a lot of phosphorus in the pond and that's causing a lot of this algal growth. And she said that for this blue-green algae, typically when you get more nitrogen in a system, so, so there's you know, the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus is higher that's when you can start to see some of these blue-green algae. And so that's why some systems get it and some systems don't it because there's that, it's that sort of balance between those nutrients. And then I also think that the, um, those blue-green algae typically prefer warmer weather. Um, and so um, you can see a lot of these, these other types of algae in the spring and you know, persisting in the summer as well, but, but you see more of this blue-green algae stuff in the mid, mid to late summer. Um, and the other thing she said that they tend to occur more when you've got still water. If you've got moving water because of an aerator or a fountain, or you've got a larger pond that has wind blowing across it, typically you won't see this blue-green algae forming as much as you would in a, in a small pond that doesn't have, have much water moving. Great, thank you for that. Um, also, Peg is asking, can you talk about other good pond edge plants like sedges and things? Yeah, um, I, I could and I would if I, if I knew a lot about it. Um, um, you know, usually when I get questions about people um, wanting to know good plants to have around their pond, I, I um, pass those questions along to someone who's better able to answer those. Um, but I would say that if, you, you know, if, you use, if you're using native plants, native emergent plants around the pond, um, then, you know, I think any native plants can be good around the pond. And there are definitely some that are less prone to becoming problematic. Um, you know, for example, you know, cattails are great, but they can really push their boundaries quickly and get and become out of control. Whereas, you know, some of the grasses, I know that I know pickerel weed is pretty popular among some people who plant 
um, plant around the ponds that they have those pretty flowers and they don't tend to get out of control too quickly. Um, but yeah, I guess um, the best thing to well, do if you're looking, sorry. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I didn't, didn't mean to interrupt you, Mitch. Yes, natives is the key, I think, and we can talk more about it. Um, uh, Jessica can talk more about it later at the end of the presentation too, to, just to let you off the hook. Okay, great. And then, you know, definitely feel free to, uh, to send me an email and I'm happy to follow up with some people and get back to you as well. And I don't see any other questions specifically for this topic or the subject we just finished. So I'll okay. let you take it over again. Great. So now um, that we've talked a little bit about uh, the types of plants we see in ponds, I wanna just talk about some of the ways that we can manage them. And there are actually lots of tools that we have for, for aquatic plant management. Uh, this, is, this section and the rest of this presentation is really focused on um, reducing plants because um, you know, most of the questions I get about plants are actually about, hey, I've got too many, how do I get rid of these? Um, but you know, I wanna reiterate that plants are really good for a pond. Uh, and if you've just recently constructed a pond, you might actually be looking to add plants to your pond and not get rid of them because you don't have that many there. Um, so, you know, I don't, wanna, don't want this to come across as plants are bad, let's get rid of all of them. It's just, this is commonly the sorts of questions I get um, are relate, you know, relating to getting, to managing and removing some of these plants. And so the, the, the five sort of tools that we have really start with prevention. You know, if we, if we have a, um, excessive plants growing in our pond, then there's likely some underlying issue um, with nutrients, with sunlight, with something like that, that we can, we can try to minimize to prevent that plant growth. And the same goes for habitat alteration. We can actually change the pond in some way to restrict the growth of some of these plants in the first place. And both of these tools are really uh, great tools to use because they typically benefit more than just plants. You know, if you're preventing nutrients entering your pond because you've got a buffer strip of vegetation, that's also preventing erosion. It's also preventing excessive sediments coming in your pond. It's gonna stop or slow the rate of sedimentation. And there are lots of different you know, positives to, to try and to prevent some of these things. But if we do get plants in there and we get a lot of plants and we need to start thinking about getting rid of some of them, we can basically physically remove them or mechanically remove them. Uh, we can employ the help of some animals and that can do some biological, biological control for us. And then we can also add uh, chemical herbicides to, to treat some of those, um, some of those plants. And, and I always tell people the best approach is to really use a combination of, of, of all of these if you can, because you, know, um, you can definitely manage plants effectively with, with herbicides, but there's, there's some downsides to, to dumping herbicides in all the time. You know, they're expensive but they can also accumulate, some of these chemicals can accumulate in your pond. So, so I think if you take a balanced approach where you try and use a few of these techniques at once, then you can sort of have the best outcomes for, for managing aquatic uh, vegetation in, in your ponds. So like I said, prevention is really just trying to prevent these plants growing in the first place. And, and, um, and you know, in most ponds in Indiana, um, they have a lot of nutrients in them. And so we're, um, we're never really going to get to us to the point where we've prevented them so much that we're actually getting not enough plants. There are definitely some situations that where plants are um, pretty scarce because of just the natural environment around a pond and we might need to do things to encourage their growth. But for the most part, uh, we have too many nutrients, too many plants, and, and, and we can definitely use some of this, some of these preventative techniques to, to help with our management. And so um, some of the ways that we can prevent plants getting in your pond. So the first thing you can do is try and minimize the dispersal of plants. And so if you know you have a, a neighboring pond or a friend's pond that, ha that has problems with, um, let's just say they have problems with duckweed um, and you don't have duckweed in your, uh, in your pond, then, you know, um, try a minute, you know, don't go over there and, and paddle around in a canoe and then bring that duckweed over to your pond. And you know, definitely birds can can bring it over too, but um, you know there are some pretty obvious things that you can do to try and prevent dispersing um, these plants. And and uh, the same you know goes for if you if they have a submergent plant that they have a problem with and and they've been using some tools to get rid of it, make sure you clean those tools before you before you use those tools in your pond because we don't want to accidentally introduce something new that's going to cause us problems down the road. And this is good practice to get into too. 
um, for invasive species. You know, if you're um, not great with plant ID, you might not be aware that some of these species are invasive and you might accidentally move them around. Um, and so it's always good practice to, you know, clean boats, clean fishing equipment, clean muck boots, um, and, and, you know, clean some of these other things that you might be moving between ponds. And, and I would say get in the practice of doing this, even if you're moving stuff between multiple ponds on your property. Uh, some of the other things you can do, you know, th this really relates to nutrients. So you can, if you, um, you know, a, a lot of the challenges I see with, with ponds is that people want, um, you know, perfectly manicured lawns right up to the edge of the pond. And then they, they don't want any, or they don't want all the vegetation that they have in their pond. And, and it's really difficult to manage between these two conflicting goals. And so, you know, if you can reduce the fertilizer application surrounding your pond, this might be on your lawns, it might be on your crops. Um, uh, and, and it also goes for other nutrients. You might have, um, you know, septic tanks that are, that are a little, you know, in disrepair and, and leaching nutrients into the pond. So there, are, there might be things you can do on the land around the pond to prevent some of these nutrients entering. Um, and then the other thing that, that I really harp on about, about a lot is, is, is maintaining buffer strips around the, the pond or lake. And, um, and um, you know, like these buffer strips just have so many benefits. You know, they prevent erosion, they prevent excessive nutrients coming in, they prevent sedimentation, they provide shade around the pond, they help attract wildlife to your pond, birds and, and butterflies. And, and there's really just, you know, endless benefits of, of these buffer vegetation and and yet you know they can Im impact your access to the pond whether you're trying to get to the shoreline to swim or to fish and so you might just be strategic about where you allow these buffer strips to grow um, you know if you have an obvious gully leading into a pond that that's where most of your nutrients come in then maybe grow some vegetation in that area and leave the other parts of the pond open for you to swim in I always encourage people not to directly add nutrients to their pond. So some people think they have to fertilize their pond to, to promote fish growth, or they might want to feed their fish with food. Both of these things will add nutrients to your pond. And if you have uh, already have plant problems, then these are just going to make the problems worse. And so there, there are some situations where uh, this is required, but they're pretty minimum, you know, they're pretty rare, um, particularly in Indiana. And so if you are considering some of this stuff, I definitely recommend reaching out to a consultant or a biologist that can help step you through this process. And, um, you, know, you know, I mentioned buffer strips a lot and this, you know, comes back to that previous question that I couldn't answer about, you know, what are some of the really, you know, beneficial plants to have in around your pond? But, you know, the buffer strip can be, uh, can be anything from some of these emergent plants like cattails, uh, water willow, uh, they can be grasses, you know, if you allow some, some native grasses to grow up, even if it, they only grow a foot high, and so you can still sort of walk through them, um, their root systems are still going to provide a lot of these benefits. Uh, and you might be able to extend some of these buffer strips back, you know, 30, 50, 100 feet and where you've got some bushes and grasses and, and other plants like that. And so um, it really just depends on how much space you have, how, you know, what level of nutrient and sediment inflow you've got and what you can, uh, what you're willing to do with regards to these, these buffer strips. And, you know, there are two ways to go about this. You can either uh, try and plant some of these things, or you can just stop your, uh, your lawn maintenance around the edge, you know, within 10, 20 feet of the pond and allow some of these plants to just establish naturally. So the second sort of, um, tool we have um, flows on from this uh, prevention approach and it's really trying to um, trying to use you know now that we know some of the things that plants need to grow what can we do to, to, to manipulate those so that the, the plants have a more difficult time growing in your pond and so that's what we refer to when we when we say habitat alteration and there are a few things that we can do so we can increase the depth of our pond so we know that plants need sunlight and the deeper your pond is, the, um, the less sunlight that's going to filter down. And so, um, for example, if you have a pond that it averages, you know, four or five feet deep, then it's, it's uh, likely that you're going to have plants growing throughout most of your pond. If you're able to increase the depth of the center of your pond, say, to 10 feet, you know, you're going to, this is going to be beneficial for fish, um, particularly in the, in the wintertime or the middle of the summer. But then what will happen is the plants are unlikely to grow in that deep section of the pond. And so rather than having 100% of your pond covered in plants, you might only have 70 or 50% of your pond. 
And so you may have may have solved a lot of your plant issues just by increasing the depth of the central part of that pond. Some other things that people do to manage their plants is, is what's called a winter drawdown. And so basically, uh, you know, not every pond has the capacity to be lowered like this, um, but basically what they're doing is, um, you know, the, a lot of these plants, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, submersed plants in particular are perennials. So they, um, they uh, grow from root systems year after year. And a lot of the other ones will, will deposit seeds and die back and then the new plants will grow the next year from those seeds. And so by what you can do is you can draw down the pond and expose a lot of those seeds and expose a lot of those underground root systems. And then through the winter, a lot of these will freeze and, uh, and that can kill off and, and cause them to be um, not viable. And so in, then as that pond fills up in the spring and the summer, um, you may be able to reduce a lot of your plant biomass because of that winter drawdown. Like I said, uh, a lot of ponds don't have the capacity to do this. Uh, and if you do do this, you want to be mindful of your fish populations too. You don't want to take 90% of the water out of your pond and then have your pond freeze completely and, and the fish die. So, uh, but that's just a technique that you might be able to do, particularly in some larger, larger lakes. Uh, one of the things you can do that control that helps control against emergent plants um, is, is adding riprap. And so, um, you know, a lot of ponds, particularly in, in um, residential areas, will have these riprap's riprap areas along the shoreline. These are predominantly used to control erosion, uh, but the the plus of this is that they also prevent plants growing along this area. You can see here that there are a few shrubs that have grown in between the rocks, but uh, nothing like it would be is if this was just a gent gently sloping bank. And so, so if you have um, you know real issues with emergent plants in some areas, you might be able to control that by putting short sections of riprap in. Um, like I said, this helps control erosion. It doesn't really help trap sediments. The sediments will still flow through these and, and into the pond. Um, it's not a, the shoreline isn't then as, um, doesn't have as, as uh, diverse habitat as, as plants, but fish and crayfish and other things can still use the spaces between this riprap uh, for habitat. So uh, it can be expensive to add riprap, particularly if you're looking to add a lot of it, but that's just one way that you can alter the habitat to prevent plants growing in some areas. And another thing that you can do is you can add dyes to your pond. And we've mentioned this in the past, uh, but because you know light is one of the key elements to, to, for plants to grow, uh, we can try and sort of mimic um, a, having a turbid or a stained pond uh, but we can, we can do this artificially and, and make the pond look more attractive. And so what some people do is if they have a pretty clear pond, you know, that clear water allows for good sunlight and, and promotes growth. And so they might add some, some dyes like aqua shade to their pond. This is a blue dye that filters out a lot of that sunlight. It prevents a lot of that, um, a lot of that plant growth, particularly in deeper parts of the pond. Um, and, and some people like the, the appearance of these blue stained or blue tinted ponds. Um, and so this can be a, another way where, you know, it might be more economical for you to buy some of this dye and add this dye than it is to buy a lot of herbicide and add, that, add those herbicides, you know, year after year. So the next um, tool we have now is, is one of the tools, you know, we're, we're getting into this stage now where we have a lot of vegetation. So what do we do to, to remove it? And so the mechanical control, control is the first uh, step to this. And so this is where we actually go in and physically rem we remove plants. Um, we can do this um, in any number of ways. There are large machines that, that can do this for us. And these are used sometimes to keep like boating canals and, and channels and stuff like that open, particularly if there are lots of, lots of vegetation in that area. Um, you can get smaller things like these, uh, these cutters and these rakes that you toss out from the side of the shoreline and you cut off plants or, uh, or you'll pull plants out of the, um, uh, out of the water. Um, there are a number of pros to this. So um, they can, um, you know, it's environmentally friendly. Some people really don't want to add chemicals or herbicides to their pond. And this could be one way that you can, you can remove some of those plants. Um, and you know, if you're able to get uh, the plants and the roots and everything out of the pond, you're actually removing the plants for good. And you're also removing that biomass. If you kill those plants by some other means, then that plant material has to break down and that can change the, the chemistry of the water. So by removing the biomass out of the pond, you can actually prevent some of those issues. 
Um, there are a lot of, well, quite a few cons with this method actually. So it's pretty time consuming as you might imagine. And it requires ongoing effort. Uh, effort. It's like weeding the garden or mowing the lawn. Um, it doesn't work well for some plants. So there are a lot of these pond plants that have complex root systems underground. And if you cut the top of that plant off, but the root system remains and those plants are just gonna grow back and you're not really gonna see any reward for, <coughs> for the effort that you've put in. Um, in those cases, you know, you probably need to try and dig out the root system as well. One of the other dangers of mechanical control is a lot of um, aquatic plants actually reproduce by fragmentation. And so what this means is if you've got a plant and you chop it up into four pieces, those four pieces will grow into four new plants. Um, and so if you're dragging these, these rakes or these um, blades through the water and chopping these plants up into lots of pieces, then you could actually be um, contributing to your, your plant problem, not solving it. So, um, so you know, I so, so mechanical control can work really well if you're trying to spot treat a certain area. So say you have a, an area around your dock that you want to keep cleaner plants, you might try and do that um, through mechanical removal. Um, and it can also be good that, you know, if, if some of these floating plants like duckweed or even filamentous algae, if you can push those to one area of your pond, say with, a, um, with an aerator, then you might be able to scoop a lot of that biomass out of the pond mechanically. Um, and then what's left, you can go back and treat with a chemical or something. Um, so there are definitely some, some applications to this, but it's, it's rarely used um, in isolation to treat an entire pond. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about a couple of um, animals we can use to help control plants. And I've mentioned these before in the past. Uh, so grass carp is a species that is, is pretty commonly sold from fish hatcheries. Um, you definitely need to make sure you buy these from a licensed hatchery because um, this ensures that they are sterile and won't be able to reproduce if they escape your pond. Uh, this is important because these grass carp are invasive. Um, but they typically uh, eat pond weeds and, and other submersed plants. Um, they don't really eat algae too much and they don't eat things like cattails. Uh, but you can uh, stock these in your pond and they can actually be pretty effective at, at eating um, some of those pond weeds and coontail and other things like that. Um, they, uh, we recommend stocking about 10 to 15 of these per acre because they do grow pretty large. Uh, and what we found uh, is that they tend to be most effective for the first five to seven years that they're in a pond. This is when they're actively growing. So they're actually eating a lot and they can do a really good job of, of controlling some of that vegetation. Um, but after that, you know, these fish grow to 20 years or more, uh, but once they stop growing in size, they actually slow their consumption down quite a bit. And so, you know, if you put 10 fish in there and, you know, 10 years later, you might have these fish that are actually not eating very much anymore and they're not doing the job that you want them to do. And so you may actually need to try and remove them and then put new ones in the pond and sort of start again. Um, I thought there was something else I was going to say about these guys. Oh, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, they, uh, they are animals and they, they have preferences to what they eat. And so, um, you know, they tend to prefer to eat things like milfoil um, and, and sometimes, you know, some of the softer vegetation. So if you have problems with hydrilla, they might actually not eat the hydrilla very much. They might prefer to eat some of the other plants that are in your pond. So, um, so, you know, success can be varied with, with these, but they, once again, they can be a good thing to have in a, in a pond as, as part of your management plan, not, not as the uh, silver bullet. And the other fish that I've mentioned before too is, is tilapia. So tilapia are, are interesting because they, um, you know, they're invasive as well, but they actually don't survive the, the, wind, the winter in, in the Midwest. And so what we can do is we can stock them in the springtime when they're pretty small. Uh, and then they predominantly eat algae. So they don't eat a lot of the, the submergent vegetation like grass carp do, but they do eat the algae, which grass carp don't. So they can once again be a nice sort of complementary part of a pond management. Um, they grow really fast. So they can grow to three or four pounds just during the summertime. Um, but they don't, you know, once the water drops below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, they start to die off. And so you really want to make sure you harvest most of these out of your pond so that they're not adding excessive nutrients to the pond once they die. Um, the good thing is that they're great to eat. And so if you are able to harvest most of these out of your pond, you can actually have a great food source for, um, you know, stock your freezer or have a big fish fry or something like that. Um, 
So I have uh, I work with somebody, one of our educators in Southern Indiana that's been experimenting with some of these and, and he's seen pretty good results of, of them eating quite a lot of that algae out of the pond. Um, he said it can be a bit tricky to harvest these out of a pond, particularly a larger pond. And so you might be able to do things where you, if you run a net across your pond, you can sort of keep them corralled in one part of the pond. Uh, he also said that, you know, once the weather cools, they start to, they don't just sort of die overnight. They start to get really sort of lethargic and, and they'll move to shallow areas that are warmer. And so they can actually be pretty easy to, to um, grab with a net um, once they get a little lethargic. So um, that can be another option. All right, and the last thing I'm gonna talk about is chemical control. But before I talk about chemical control, I might see if there are any other questions that we, that we can talk about before we jump into the chemicals. Anyone uh, with questions can put those in the chat. Regarding habitat, um, Mitch, Jessica Miller asked about prairie drop seed being a good native grass for buffer around a small pond. I said we could talk more about it later, but if you have something to, if you have thoughts on that now. Yeah, I have no thoughts on that, but it seems like it would be a, <laughs> uh, be a, a good, um, a good was, sort of buffer plant. I was trying to save you from that and then I put you on the spot anyway. <laughs> That's all right. I don't mind saying I don't know. Something. <laughs> <laughs> um, here is a question um, uh, regarding uh, mechanical control. Where can someone purchase those big rakes? Yeah, um, I would probably just look online. There are a bunch of um, sort of outfitters that sell not only the, the chemicals that you can buy, but also some of those tools. Um, so I would look online. Um, there's actually a great, um, I, I might mention this later on too, but there's actually um, a great resource uh, for those of you that use Facebook. There's a there's a group there that's um, I forget what it's called. It's like private like management comments questions or whatever. But it's basically a, a group that you can request to join. I think there are about two thousand people in that group, and then um, basically people just post questions and answers and comments and all sorts of things. And so. Um, you know, that would be a, if you're interested in some of this stuff, you could uh, join that group and then, you, you know, you might be able to find out where people have bought their stuff from, or there might even be someone close to you that you can borrow some of their equipment. So, so I'll provide a link to that group um, that, that um, we can share around, but, but, you know, I would just um, Google, you know, some, you know, pond supplies or pond um, rakes or whatever, and, and see where you, where you end up. And I'm sure there are a bunch of different places that you can, that you can buy some of these. Um, it's always good if you can get reviews or recommendations from people too, because I'm sure some of these things work better than others. So, um, uh, so it's always nice if you can, if you can try some of this stuff out. Thank you. I think that's uh, it for the questions for this section. I will say one thing that um, regarding the mechanical control, which I didn't talk about, but something, some, uh, something that we use uh, in some of our ponds. So we have a bunch of quarter acre ponds that we use for research and, and uh, you know, various other things, but, but we'll often get some of these uh, submergent plants growing in them. Uh, and so what we'll do is actually, you know, these are, you know, quarter acre rectangular ponds and we have a, a large length of chain that we actually string up between two vehicles and then drag that train along the length of the pond. And, and that could be a really good way to, to try and remove some of this, um, some of this vegetation. So you, you, what we'll do is, um, is we'll do that. We'll try and remove as much of that biomass as we can. And then a few days later, once the pond settles down and we can see how much we have left, that's when we might add a, a small dose of, of herbicide or something. So um, that's just another, another thing you can think about with some of that mechanical control. And Leah shared that um, her parents used everything they raked out of the pond as great compost. Oh, that's a great idea, yeah. Okay, so um, let's jump into the chemical control now. Um, and so chemical control is um, popular and it's, it's effective, um, but there are definitely a number of things that you need to think about if you, if you wanna use chemicals to control plants in your pond. And so, um, like I've said before, you know, it's important to know what plants you have because different chemicals work for different plants. Uh, and accuracy is really important. So you wanna make sure that you have a good understanding of the size of your pond. Uh, a lot of these um, chemicals, their dosages are by acre foot. And so that basically means that, you know, if your pond is one acre in surface area and an average of three feet deep, then your pond would be three acre feet. 
Um, but it's important to, to go out and calculate your volume or your area of your pond so that you can apply some of these at the correct dosages. Uh, it's important to select the right chemicals to do the job. Um, and it's also really important to, to read the labels and to follow all the precautions on the labels. The labels will have information about what safety equipment you need, you know, whether you need uh, goggles or gloves or, or anything like that. It'll tell you how to, you know, if, if you need, what you need to do for first aid, but it'll also tell you um, some what use restrictions there are for the chemicals. So sometimes when you apply a herbicide, you need to refrain from drinking the water or using it for irrigation for three days or five days or something like that. So, so it's really important that you read the label two, three times before you apply um, so that you're applying the correct dosages and things like that. Um, sometimes you can apply a smaller dose if you have, um, you know, if you have um, lighter um, aquatic vegetation issues, or if you're looking to just sort of, sort of, you know, knock down the vegetation a little bit rather than killing it all. Um, but you might have to just um, talk to somebody about this or, or, um, or at least try a few things, because sometimes if you apply a lower dosage, you'll see no results at all. And that's sort of a bit of a waste of money. So, um, so just, you know, think about if you've, if you've never used chemicals before and you're looking to, to use some chemicals for your pond, I definitely re recommend reaching out to somebody who's had experience with it that can sort of um, give you some recommendations or some guidance. And, uh, you know, just like every other tool that we've discussed today, this, these herbicides are not a silver bullet. You know, you can definitely put enough herbicide in your pond to get rid of all the vegetation, um, but then that's going to be really expensive and it's also going to be, you're really going to have poor outcomes for, for fish and, and for your ecosystem. Um, you know, I'd, I'd probably recommend that if you want to do that, it would be cheaper to just install a swimming pool. Um, but, um, but when it's used with other methods and, and when it's used correctly, it can be a great tool that, to help manage your vegetation and to, and to allow you to not only have good uh, vegetation in your pond, but to also have um, you know, enjoyable use of that pond. Um, and with uh, herbicides, it, it often requires uh, multiple applications to sort of knock something back. And um, you know, this comes back to the idea that you really don't want to kill everything off in your pond, particularly all at once, uh, because what will happen is you'll have, you know, tons of, of uh, organic matter in your pond that as, is, as it's broken down by bacteria, it will use all the oxygen in your pond. And so, you know, if you have really bad um, filamentous algae in your pond, then, you know, usually I recommend treating 10 to 20% of it at a time um, so that you're not, you know, having a huge kill off of algae and, and sub subsequent problems from that. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of these plants are, are seasonal and they, there's a succession um, in plant growth through your pond throughout the season. And so, you know, you might have to apply certain chemicals at certain times of the year and, and different chemicals at others to, to control some of these plants. But, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's great. It um, can be a great uh, tool as part of your management, but it's not a, a silver bullet. And, and it's, uh, it, you know, it's expensive as well for, um, for some of these chemicals. So I want to just define um, a few different things that you'll see if you're starting to consider chemical control. Um, and so um, the herbicides that we use for aquatic plants can either be contact herbicides or systemic herbicides. And so a contact herbicide is basically that starts to kill a plant when it comes in contact with the plant. And so you spray you know, a herbicide on the plant, on its leaves, it starts to kill the plant um, like that. And, and so these herbicides are, are common for terrestrial plants. Uh, they're common for some, for some uh, pond plants as well. And they're best used for spot treatment. So you might, like I said, if you have issues with a certain plant around your dock, you might be able to go and use a contact herbicide to sort of clean up that area, but it's not really going to affect the plants that you didn't spray. Some herbicides that we use in the, in the ponds are also uh, systemic herbicides. And so these are chemicals that are, um, that are absorbed into the plant and then transported throughout the plant's body and then uh, actually um, you know, kills the plant from the inside. Uh, and they can also sort of, if, you, know, you can also treat your entire pond with these systemic herbicides. Typically these herbicides um, take longer to work. And so a contact herbicide, you might start seeing results in a day or two. And some of these systemic herbicides, you might only start seeing a result in, in a month because it, it spreads throughout the entire pond and it, it's, it's waiting for those plants to absorb the, uh, the chemical and those plants are sort of dying slowly, but, but then you know, it, it's uh, more effective for some types of plants. 
Some of you might be uh, familiar with the term surfactant. This is just a, uh, a chemical that's in the herbicide that helps the, the active ingredient penetrate the plant tissue. The reason I mention this is because um, it's even though uh, some of these aquatic herbicides might have a similar or the same active ingredient as your, the herbicides you use on land, quite often the surfactant is what, what's different in that formulation. And this is important because, for example, um, you know, aquatic glyphosate is something that we use to control emergent plants like cattails. Um, and if you just use regular Roundup, the regular you know, terrestrial glyphosate, the surfactant that's used in that will actually kill your fish. And so that's why it's important to use the aquatic form of glyphosate, not uh, the terrestrial form. And I, you know, that goes for all of these aquatic herbicides. It's, um, it's really important to use the aquatic formulation, not, not the terrestrial formulation that you might have um, in your shed and, and you use for something else. Um, a lot of these chemicals are available as both granules or liquids. Some of them are just granules, some of them are just liquids. Um, the label will give you all the information you need about how to apply those. Um, for granules, you can, you can sort of broadcast those over an area. Um, I've seen people put them in like um, mesh sacks and sort of like tow them around the boat in a canoe or, or throw them out in the pond and, um, and just sort of let them dissolve. Um, for the liquids, you know, the best way to do it is to, is to dilute it with pond water in a, in a sprayer and then um, go around and spray the areas and, and to make sure you use the, the dilution rate that the, um, that the label recommends. Another thing I'll, I'll say too is that not all formulations and, and not all products are equal. So you might find a, a product that is a lot less expensive um, than, than a, another product that has the same active ingredient but its concentration may be a lot lower. And so you might actually not be saving as much money um, because you've got to apply three times the dose to, to get the same results. And so just keep an eye out for that as you're uh, researching and potentially buying some of these herbicides. And I'll say again that, you know, it's really important to read the label. Um, the label has all the information you need about dosages, about restrictions, about how to apply them, about the safety precautions you need to take. And, you know, it's like that old adage, like measure twice, cut once. Um, it's the same for the, you know, measure the label a couple of times, make sure you really understand what you need to do before you, before you go out there and apply these. Because, um, you know, unlike some of the other things we do in ponds, like controlling fish, um, you know, harvesting fish, stocking fish, um, even some of the other, you know, mechanical controls for, for uh, plants, these, these chemicals can be a one and done situation. You might have a pond that you've, you spent a lot of money constructing, you stocked with fish, you've been working really hard on it. And if you uh, just apply the wrong dose of these chemicals, you can basically you know, wipe out your entire pond and you'd have to start again. So, so there really can be some, some, uh, some bad implications for, for not applying these correctly. Um, in terms of applying these, these herbicides, you know, the, the, um, the label should give you information about when, when the best time to apply these is. Typically, it's best applied when the plant is actively growing. When the plant's active, actively growing, that's when they're absorbing nutrients and they'll also absorb the chemical and the chemical will likely have the, the best result. Uh, for most plants, this is, you know, spring and early summer. Um, and, you know, in particular, like I said, it's often best to uh, um, apply uh, multiple smaller applications. And so you might, as, the, um, as your filamentous algae starts to grow in the spring, you might decide to do an application pretty early on before that becomes out of control so that you can sort of keep it at lower levels throughout the summer. Um, so that's, you know, that's the best pro uh, approach to take for a lot of these plants is, is once you see them sort of popping up in your pond, you might start some of these smaller applications to see if you can sort of just keep on top of them. However, some plants, it's actually best to uh, make these applications in the fall. And so uh, things like cattails, uh, what happens is, you know, they grow throughout the summer. Uh, and then just before the fall, they act, rather than putting energy into growth, they actually put a lot of energy into storing, storing nutrients for the winter. And so if we apply the chemicals then in the fall, what happens is they sort of store those chemicals and take those chemicals deep into their roots and deep into their body. And they'll actually be more effective than if you apply um, those chemicals to the cattails in the spring. And so, so there are some plants that are that where it's best to apply some of these um, chemicals in the fall. 
Um, and like I said, it's always best to, to apply less chemical more often rather than a single large dose. Uh, once again, you know, read the label to see what their dosage recommendations are. Speak to some local experts, you know, that can help you with your specific example um, to see whether, um, you know, what a good sort of maintenance dose of herbicide is um, for your pond. Okay, I just wanted to highlight a few products that are, that are pretty common and that you might've heard of or you might've seen um, and talk a little bit about their usage and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I will say that the, the, um, the plant uh, management publication that I referenced at the start um, has a table with the different chemicals in it, what plants they use to treat and some of the considerations when using those chemicals. And we're in the process of updating that table for the new publication that'll be out um, here in the next six months. Um, so that, that should be a good starting point um, to get an idea of what chemicals you might need for your situation and some of the things con to consider when you use those chemicals. So <clears throat> there are a few different products that we can use to treat algae. Um, and the two most common are, are these two copper-based products. So, Copper sulfate is something that's been used to treat algae in ponds for more than 50 years. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's typically um, sold as, as these in these granular crystals. Um, they can be uh, pretty effective for, for treating algae. Um, the thing is that these, this copper sulfate needs to be, typically needs to be used at higher concentrations than some other products. Um, what happens then is that these higher concentrations of copper will accumulate in your pond and over time can cause issues in your pond. Like um, when your pond gets a lot of copper in it, it can cause problems for a lot of these invertebrates and other things growing in your pond. Um, it, um, the other thing about copper sulfate is it doesn't work very well in hard water, which, which most ponds in Indiana have hard water. Uh, what happens is uh, when you have hard water, the, the, basically the copper sulfate um, it's sort of gets it, it comes out of solution quickly and then is not available to, to treat or to kill those those herbicides and so if you have um, hard water in your pond um, or if you're looking to use something with lower uh, copper concentrations the the products that you should check out are these chelated copper products so chelated basically means that there's a protective layer around the around the copper and that protects it from the hard water sort of dissolving it and taking it out of solution. Uh, this, these chelated copper products, so this is, is an example of one here, which is Cutrine Plus. They typically come in a, um, in a liquid form. Uh, they're more expensive, but they have lower concentrations of copper. So that means you, you use less of them to begin with, uh, but also it prevents or it, it slows down that accumulation of copper in your pond. Uh, it also stays active um, and effective longer in your pond and, and therefore is able to be more effective at killing the, the algae. And the real benefit is, of this is that you can use it in hard water and you can also use it in turbid water. So sometimes turbid water can cause problems with using certain chemicals, but these chelated products are, are able to be used in, in turbid murky water. Um, and this is, you know, this uh, talking about these, these algicides are uh, really, um, demonstrates the importance of, of uh, species ID. So like I said, cara is a macroalgae. It looks a lot like pondweeds, um, but if you treat it with something for pondweeds, you're probably not gonna kill it. It actually needs to be treated like, just like you would uh, filamentous algae or blue-green algae or, or phytoplankton or something like that. So a couple of uh, common contact herbicides are uh, endothol and diquat. And so both of these are used for um, controlling submersed plants. Um, so these are things like pondweeds, hydrilla, milfoil, coontail. Um, uh, endothol, some formulations of endothol will actually also help you kill cara, that macroalgae. Um, but because most of these, because these uh, two groups of herbicides are contact herbicides, they can be used for spot treatment. So like I said, if you have some of these um, dense, you know, areas of, of pond weeds around your dock, you can just apply the area around where you want to use the pond and it, and it will kill those off, but it won't you know, kill the, the vegetation that's the other, on the other side of your pond. I mentioned that, um, that duckweed uh, can, be, uh, can be problematic 
to treat. And so the diquat is actually something that you can use to, to treat duckweed. It doesn't um, eradicate it from your pond, but you can use it as these like contact uh, knockdown treatments in certain areas. So for example, if you have this floating duckweed on your pond, you have a storm come through and it blows it all into one part of your pond, that might be a good opportunity to, to spray some diquat on it to, to serve as a knockdown treatment um, to, to sort of help manage that in your, in your pond. And then I want to just now uh, talk about two common systemic herbicides. So I'll start at the bottom here. Um, I guess I forgot to change the uh, photos on this slide. So don't look at those bottles because they're, they're from the last slide. <laughs> um, so glyphosate is, is typically what we use on emergent plants as well as some of the floating plants. So anywhere where the plant is exposed to the air, we're able to use glyphosate to spray directly on the plant to, to help kill the plant. Um, so this is used for cattails, uh, a lot of the, the emergent vegetation, and it's also used for things like, um, like water lilies and stuff like that. Like I said, it's really important that you use the aquatic formulation of this as, as the terrestrial formulation can actually kill your fish. Um, you can use it as a spot treatment um, on the plants, um, um, but the, the, uh, the chemical is actually translated, uh, translocated through the plant to the root system. And so Glyphosate can be really effective on some of these emergent plants because like I said, often you might go in there and try and cut them down or remove them, but you're actually leaving behind some of that root system. And so, um, and so using glyphosate, it's actually gonna go in and kill the root system and can actually help uh, you know, completely get, get rid of that plant that you've uh, sprayed it on. Uh, and like I mentioned um, earlier, you know, a lot of these glyphosate applications are best um, made in the in the fall when those plants are storing energy into their roots. And the last um, common herbicide I want to talk about is fluoridone. So fluoridone is also a systemic herbicide. So it's it's um, absorbed in you know into the plant and it can be used to a, to treat a whole pond. So this is different to some of the the spot treatments we've spoken about at the moment. Um, the fluoridone is, uh, it controls a lot of the submersed plants like pondweeds, coontails. It can also um, uh, treat floating plants like duckweeds and watermeal. Um, and so the way that fluoridone works is you actually apply it to the entire pond. And so that's why it's, this one is really important to calculate the volume of your pond because you add a certain application to that entire pond. Uh, and what happens then is the fluoridone sort of spreads throughout the pond and it's absorbed by the plants in the pond. Um, and the way that fluoridone works is it actually prevents the, um, the plants uh, photosynthesizing. So it blocks their ability to photosynthesize, photosynthesize, geez, struggling a bit today. <laughs> um, and so uh, what this means is it's basically starving the plant of energy. And so it actually takes a lot longer to work than some of these contact herbicides. And so if you apply fluoridone to your pond, it may take kind of one to three months to actually see the results. The benefits is that it's a, it's a systemic herbicide, so it's killing the plants off completely and is actually working on a number of different plants throughout your entire pond. So depending on your situation, you know, fluoridone might be an option for you. All right, that is pretty much uh, all I'm gonna talk about today. There's a lot I didn't cover, but hopefully that gives you a good overview of aquatic plants and, and how we might go about managing them. I just wanna reiterate, you know, even though this, this presentation focuses a lot on you know, death to the plants, uh, plants are actually uh, really important in ponds. Uh, and if you want um, anything except a swimming pool, you know, it is really good to have plants in your pond. They can help manage your water quality. They help promote fish production. Um, they attract wildlife to your ponds. And so, you know, so plants are, so there are a lot of great uh, reasons to have plants in your pond. Um, and these, these tools are really for just if certain plants, um, you know, get out of control and need to be sort of brought back into check a little bit in your pond. So, and given that this is the last um, presentation in the series, I do want to just remind you about our website. So the, the uh, link to the website is here. Uh, you can contact me directly through this website if you if you can't find my email. But this is where we have all of our resources. Um, our podcast episodes go up here. Um, and if you go to the Find Your County contact page, this is where you can search in your county for, for
for biologists and consultants and, and other people that can help you directly um, with your pond. So yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mitch. That was really uh, great. I wanna thank you very much for uh, participating um, with us, partnering with Women for the Land and doing all four of this uh, four-part series. It's been wonderful and they will all be available for you all to reference in future on YouTube. And um, I think we might have a few more questions, but I'm actually gonna stop the recording now and so we can um, all chat.